thank you all for coming. Uh, today I'm going to be telling you about flexible schemes and more uh, about experimental enumeration of pattern avoiding permutations. Uh, so before I begin, I'd like to thank a few people. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank my advisor, uh, Dr. Z, for his support, for introducing me to the world of experimental math, and for suggesting most of the problems that I'm going to be talking to you guys about. Uh, I'd also like to thank all of my committee members, so that's Vince, Swastik, and Vargov, uh, for agreeing to be on my committee. Uh, and in particular, I'd like to thank Vince for suggesting the problem that sort of led to the first uh, topic that I'm going to be telling you guys about. Uh, finally, uh, this is an experimental math talk, and experimental math means that you have to have a lot of computer power. Uh, and so I used the Amaral cluster at Rutgers a lot, and so I'd like to acknowledge the Rutgers Office of Advanced Research Computing for making that resource available. All right, so the first thing that I'm going to be talking about is pattern avoidance. So let's define some terms. Uh, permutation is some reordering of the numbers uh, one up the rest. For example, if a permutation is going to, or an example of a permutation is 2, 4, 5, 1, 3, and that's a permutation of the numbers 1 through 5. It's oftentimes helpful to think about permutations visually, such as using the, the grid that you can see at the bottom of the screen here. You can see that this grid is a representation of 2, 4, 5, 1, 3. You can the second dot, the, 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 on the left, the second smallest dot, then the fourth smallest, the largest, and, and so on. Uh, all right, so one thing that we like to talk about uh, in terms of permutations is pattern containment. And so a permutation contains a pattern. If we can take some of the elements of that permutation, and if we just look at those particular elements, uh, we see if they have the same relative order as the pattern. And if they do, then we say that the permutation contains the pattern. Uh, so, for example, 2, 4, 5, 1, 3 contains the pattern 1, 3, 2, because if we just look at 2, 5, and 3, they have the same order, smallest, largest, and then middle, as 1, 3, 2. However, um, Bargov is asking if I can mute everyone. Um, I think I can mute everyone. Uh, let me just finish the slide in my well. Uh, so, 2, 4, 5, 1, 3 does not contain 3, 2, 1, and that's because it doesn't contain any three elements all in decreasing order. Uh, and the picture that you see is showing that 2, 4, 5, 1, 3 contains 1, 3, 2 because of the, the, dot, the red dots are an occurrence of 1, 3, 2. All right, so now let's see if I can mute everyone. Um, I guess except for maybe I'll leave the committee members able to, to talk to me. Um, All right. Uh, okay, so I guess I can mute everyone, and then if you have a question that you want to ask me, then you can unmute yourself. All right. Uh, is it better? Okay. So let's continue then. Um, right, so the next topic uh, after pattern containment is pattern avoidance. Uh, if some permutation pi fails to contain a pattern, then we say that uh, the permutation avoids the pattern. And the, de the definite the notation that I'm going to use is that uh, the avoidance class of some pattern sigma uh, n is the set of all permutations of length n that avoid that pattern sigma. So for example, uh, avoid 1, 2, 3 is all of the length 3 permutations that have no elements in increasing order. And that's just three, two, one. Uh, the usual, or the sort of the most classic question in permutation patterns is for some fixed pattern sigma, can you find a formula or a generating function or some recurrence or some way to easily enumerate or easily find the size of the avoidance class uh, avoid sigma n? Uh, and there's a bunch of classical theorems on this subject. The earliest goes back more than 100 years. Uh, in 1915, uh, McMahon showed that the number of permutations of length n that avoid 1, 2, 3 is the nth Catalan number, uh, and the formula is given on the slide. Uh, Erdős and Sekeres's famous uh, longest uh, monotone subsequence theorem 
can be formulated as a theorem about permutation patterns. Uh, and what it says is that the avoidance class, uh, where you avoid both the length k increasing pattern and the length l decreasing pattern, uh, the avoidance class is empty if n is too large relative to k and uh, The study of permutation patterns, though, really sort of began in earnest with Knuth in the art of computer programming. And he showed that not only uh, is the, uh, the set of permutations avoiding one, two, three counted by the Catalan numbers, but actually that's true for every length, length three permutation. So all six of them are all counted by the Catalan numbers. Um, all right, so those are some classical results on permutation patterns. Uh, but what I want to talk to you today about is not that, or is related to that, but not exactly that. I want to specifically talk to you about enumeration schemes. Uh, so enumeration schemes are one of several automatic enumeration techniques. Uh, they're fully rigorous. They were introduced originally by Zeilberger in 1998. They were significantly expanded by Vatter in 2005, uh, applied to words by Pudwell in 08, and then applied to not just the patterns that I've talked about, but something a little bit different called vincular patterns uh, by Baxter and Pudwell in 2012. Uh, so enumeration schemes are an example of experimental math. Uh, and by experimental math, I just mean math where a computer plays an essential role. Uh, and so there's several reasons that you might want to do experimental math. Uh, one is that you as a person only have one brain, but computers have many processors and you can use many computers at once. Uh, humans also make mistakes uh, and computers don't. And if a computer does make a mistake, it's usually because a human screwed up programming it. Uh, and finally, computers are always improving. The chips are always getting smaller. They're always getting faster. Uh, but humans have not been upgraded in 200,000 years, despite you know, countless documented methods. Uh, so here's many good reasons to use computers in your math. The general goal of enumeration schemes, and in general, any experimental approach to pattern avoidance, is that we're going to want to input a pattern or a set of patterns and then we're going to want to do some work. We're going to have our computer check some things out. And hopefully, it'll produce a certificate for us. And when it does produce a certificate for us, we can use that certificate to find uh, the size of this avoidance class avoids sigma n in polynomial time, where it's a polynomial in n. Uh, and the key object that we're going to be looking at is the z sets. And I really only have this definition on this slide so that I can say that I gave you a precise definition of a z-set. I don't expect anyone to actually read it. Um, the important thing to notice is that there's three arguments to this z-function. There's the pattern that you're trying to avoid. There's this set of d's that's called down fix. And then there's this set of g's that's called the gap vector. On the next slide, I'll explain exactly what those do uh, via an example. So here's your example. Uh, let's look at z of 1, 3, 2, 2, 1, and then our gap vector is 1, 0, 2. Uh, so what the down fix of 2, 1 means is that 2 and 1 occur in that order in the permutation. So if you look at the three permutations in the set, they all have 2, 1 in that order. Uh, then what the gap vector does is the gap vector tells you where the down fix elements occur inside the permutation. So its first element is a 1. That means that there's one permutation element before the 2. Uh, the second element is a zero. That means that there's zero elements between one and the third. This is a one and a two, which means elements that occur after the one. Uh, and here are the three permutations that fulfill those criteria and also avoid one, three, two. And then you also have uh, pictures of them on the same slide. So our goal is going to be to find the number of permutations of length n that avoid one, two, three. And equivalently, that's going to be z of 1, 2, 3, and then the empty set and the gap factor n. And so we start out with no elements of our permutation, and we're going to build it up element by element. So the first element that we add, we can add it anywhere we want. We now have a down fix of 1. We have a gap of g1 on the left side of that element, and a gap of g2 on the right side. Now I'm going to add a second element, and this time I have a choice. I could either add my element, my two element after the one, as you see on the left side of your screen, or I could add the two element before the one, as you see on the right side of the screen. 
and I make one of those two choices, and in each case, I get a new gap. Uh, but something interesting happens with the, first, with the second choice. Uh, if that one is ever going to be a problem for me, if it's ever going to participate in a one, two, three pattern, that must mean that there's two things larger than it to its right. And whatever those two things that are larger than it to its right are, they're going to form a one, two, three pattern with the two. Uh, and so what that means is that my one is just not important. If it ever participates in the forbidden pattern, something else will cause that forbidden pattern anyway. So I can forget about the one and delete it. And in general, that's how uh, these enumeration schemes work. We take a down fix, we figure out what elements we can delete, we delete them, and then we get a simpler down fix. And that drives our recurrence forward. Uh, all right, we've, I've only reduced one of my link to down fixes. I need to get the other one too. The way that I'm going to do that is I'm going to look at my second down fix, which was uh, the one, two, one. And I'm going to say, how big is G3? Is G3 at least one? Uh, or sorry, that should be greater than or equal to one. Uh, is there something that comes after two? And if there's something that comes after two, then it has to be bigger than two. And so I have a one, two, three pattern. And nothing that fulfills those criteria can ever be in my Z set because it'll have to contain one, two, three. On the other hand, if G3 is equal to zero, then my two can never participate in a forbidden pattern, so I can just delete it just like I deleted the one last time. And again, I've managed to put myself back into a simpler, a smaller down fix. All right, so here's a, the resulting set of occurrences, and this gives you a very fast, efficient way to calculate the number of one, two, three avoiding permutations. And a computer could find this for itself. All right, so uh, here's the general algorithm. I'm going to input a down fix D1, D2 up through DK in a pattern. I'm going to determine which gap vectors guarantee me that my forbidden pattern always has to occur. So in the last example, that was when G3 was bigger than zero. Uh, then I'm going to look at all of the other gap vectors. And I'm going I'm to say, can any of my down fix elements be deleted? Uh, so in the last example, two could be deleted. And if so, I can rewrite the size of this set, uh, the size of this Z set as the size of a different Z set with a shorter down fix. Uh, and if not, then I'll separate my Z set into several uh, more Z sets based on uh, where the next largest element occurs. All right, so that's, uh, so that is sort of how enumeration schemes work. Uh, the next, topic that I want to mention is the insertion encoding, which is just a different experimental approach to uh, enumerating these pattern avoiding permutations. Uh, so the insertion encoding is a technique for constructing a permutation element by element. It was introduced by Albert Linton and Ruschkutz in 2005, and it was sort of reformulated by Vatter in 2012. Uh, the way it works is we're going to map insertions to letters. We're going to think about how we build a, a permutation uh, element by element. And so what we're going to do is we're going to start with this diamond thing, which is called an active site. And what an active site means is that you're allowed to add a new element into it. And in fact, you're required to add a new element into it. So we do. We add a 1 into our active site. And we're actually going to add a 1 into the middle of our active site, which means it gets two new active sites on either side of it. And we're going to record that with a letter, and we're going to record it with the letter M1, because we added something to the middle of the first active site. Then we're going to add 2 to the left of the, the first active site. And adding to the left of the first active site means that it now has an active site on it. The 2 has an active site on its right, but it doesn't have one on its left. And we're going to record that as L1. And then we're going to continue making the permutation just like that. And eventually, we'll have the full permutation, 2, 4, 5, 1, 3 and its corresponding string M1, L1, F2, L1, F1. And sort of the insight of the original authors was that we can infer things about the permutations just by looking at the strings. So what they said is consider the strings that correspond to permutations in some avoidance class, and we're going to call the set of all these strings the language. Uh, we can ask whether this language is regular. So a regular language is one where I can where I, uh, that has a finite uh, a finite state accepting automaton. So it's like a box that goes between different states. Uh, you feed it a letter, and it moves to a new state. You feed it another letter, and it moves to a new state. Uh, and at the end, 
you should be able to tell whether the uh, whether the string is in your language based on where the uh, automaton ended up. So if the language is regular, then that means that there's a fast. When I say fast, I don't just mean polynomial time; I actually mean linear time algorithm to calculate the size of the avoidance class. Uh, and the original authors also came up with a nice characterization of which permutation classes have regular insertion encodings. And that's that they do if they contain only finitely many vertical alternations. And a vertical alternation is uh, a permutation where all of the even elements are larger than all of the el odd elements, uh, or vice versa. Uh, all right, so, so far I haven't actually talked about anything uh, original in my thesis, uh, but I'm about to now. Uh, the stuff that I actually worked on are called flexible schemes. And the goal of flexible schemes is to generate uh, generalized enumeration schemes so that they can uh, enumerate any permutation class that either has a finite uh, traditional scheme or a regular insertion encoding. Um, and this problem was suggested to me by, by Ben Spad. Uh, the main idea that's going to help us do this is to ask what if there's restrictions on our gap vectors that don't make our Z sets necessarily empty but that do let us rewrite them using smaller down classes. So let's look at an example of why, why we might hope that this would work. Uh, let's suppose that the permutations that we're trying to avoid are 1, 4, 2, 3, and 2, 3, 1, 4. And let's suppose that we're trying to reduce the down fix 3, 2, 1 to a smaller one. Because again, we win when we can always reduce down fixes to smaller ones. Uh, so the Z set that we're considering is this one shown at five on, this, on the slide. And as it turns out, if G2 is at least one, then we, we aren't guaranteed a forbidden pattern, but we are guaranteed that we can delete one in the down fix. And if G2 is equal to one, or sorry, equal to zero, then we can delete three in the down fix. So we were never guaranteed a forbidden pattern, but in either of these two cases, we we're able to reduce our down fix to something simpler. Uh, and that's just as good. All right, so let me talk now about how a computer is going to think about schemes. Uh, so a computer thinks about schemes as a set of replacement rules. So for instance, the replacement rule that you see on the slide, uh, that tells the computer that if you take a 3, 2, 1 down fix, if then uh, it's, it's the first part tells it that this is a rule that applies to 3, 2, 1 down fixes. So then it looks at the second part, and it sees that the first rule is that uh, if your second element is at least 1, and all of your other elements are at least zero in your gap vector, but all elements are always at least zero, so that's, that's always satisfied, then you can delete uh, the third element. On the other hand, if that's not true, you move on to the next rule, uh, which says that if all of your gap vector elements are at least zero, which again, they always are, uh, then you can uh, delete one. So here's a scheme for one, two, three avoiders. Uh, it's very simple, uh, and a computer could read this and then immediately know exactly how to count the number of one, two, three avoiding permutations. Um, it would consider all possible late two down fixes and then reduce them using these given replacement rules. Uh, and it's really important that our computers be able to uh, use these schemes, that we be able to find schemes with, uh, with a computer because finding these schemes by hand is extremely difficult, extremely uh, time-consuming, and frankly, a little bit tedious as well. Uh, so this would sort of not be an interesting thing to do, uh, except it is interesting because you can get a computer to do all of the sort of tedious experimental math. All right, so let's talk about how a computer actually would go about finding uh, finding a scheme. Uh, so what we want to know is we want to know when we're allowed to delete down fix elements. Um, and what we'd like to say, and so what this theorem says is that if we can't delete a down fix element, if we're not allowed to do it, then there will be a pretty small gap vector that proves to us already that we're not allowed to do it. So if we check all of our small gap vectors and we see, oh, none of these were a problem, uh, whenever this was the gap vector, I was allowed to delete an element. Then we know by this theorem that we're always allowed to delete an element. Uh, and the bad thing that could happen uh, would be if you deleted an element and that got rid of the only occurrence of a bad permutation. 
what we want to know is that whenever we delete an element, either there was no bad pattern to begin with, or there still is a bad pattern once we delete the element. Um, all right. So now let's look at sort of a, a proof by picture of this theorem. Uh, so let's suppose that we're looking uh, at the down fix one, two, we're trying to avoid this, you know, this pattern three, two, one. Uh, and we want to know if there's any permutations with this down fix one, two, and this gap vector two, two, one, that uh, are bad. We want to know if there's any where deleting an element, uh, deleting a down fix element, uh, gets rid of the only instance of a forbidden pattern. Uh, so let's look at this down fix element two. So that's the one in purple on the slide. Uh, notice that right now that two is part of a three, two, one pattern. Uh, but if I delete it, there are no more three, two, one patterns left. And so I'm, that proves, that witnesses uh, the fact that I'm not allowed to delete the two. Uh, but what, what I would hope, what the theorem says has to happen is that uh, there has to be a shorter gap vector that already witnessed the fact that I couldn't delete this two. And the way that I'm going to form that gap vector is I'm going to take uh, all of the points that I needed to make sure that I satisfied this gap condition H, so that's the one on the far right, as well as two points that created a bad pattern with that purple dot. Uh, I'm going to keep those, and I'm going to get rid of all the other ones. Uh, and so now what I've got is I've got a smaller permutation that also has the property that it contains a bad 3, 2, 1 pattern, and that when I delete the purple dot, I no longer have a bad 3, 2, 1 pattern. All right, so the other important thing is that I claim to you that flexible schemes could count anything at all that a regular uh, traditional insertion, or a traditional enumeration scheme or a regular insertion encoding could count, uh, and so that had better be true. Uh, and this theorem says what it is. It says that if you have some set of forbidden patterns, then and that that set of that set of forbidden patterns uh, gives you an avoidance class with a regular insertion encoding, then that class also must have a finite flexible scheme. Uh, and here's a very hand wavy proof outline. Uh, recall that the regular insertion encoding was equivalent to saying that your permutation class only has finitely many vertical alternations. And we'll say that they all have length less than two. Then any gap vector has to have less than k positive entries, or it's not going to give you any valid permutations, because you could take k plus one positive entries and k plus one down fix elements and make a vertical alternation of length two k plus two. Uh, so you're going to choose some down fix pi and some gap vector with, again, fewer than k positive entries. And so what has to happen for a down fix element not to be deletable? There has to be some permutation that sort of makes it not deletable. Um, and so consider some down fix element and look at the permutation that sort of makes it not deletable, the permutation that contains a forbidden subpattern only because that down fix element is there. And notice that each permutation will only do that for finitely many uh, down fix elements, and there's only finitely many permutations. Uh, and so if your down fix is long enough, then there has to be a deletable element. All right. So um, now we've Yona, seen... uh, yeah. Can I ask a question? Yes. Uh, so you, you proved that every insert, uh, in certain whatever can be done with flexible scheme. So uh, did they implement it? Did these people, Albert et al, implement it? And if you, once you make it into flexible scheme, is it uh, more efficient? So you I believe that uh, the original authors did not implement it, although Vince did implement it. Um, and it is unfortunate, actually, you'll see this on the next slide. Uh, unfortunately, flexible schemes are less efficient because they only give polynomial time enumeration and sort of using this insertion encoding idea will give you a uh, linear time enumeration. Ah, but flexible scheme can do other things. Right. right. So you, yeah. that's, that's the, that's the price that you have to pay to be able to count all these other classes of permutations. Okay. Thank you. Um, all right, so uh, as promised, flexible schemes count anything that regular integration schemes or uh, insertion encodings can. Uh, but as it turns out, they can also count a lot of other things. Uh, and so this table 
shows you the results of uh, my experiments on how, how well flexible schemes work, essentially. So for instance, this first row uh, tells you about all of the patterns of length three. Uh, so that's the six permutations of length three. And there's actually, there's sort of a, some trivial symmetries in these patterns. Uh, so for instance, if, uh, you know, the, if you know how to count the number of the avoidance class of one pattern, then you automatically know how to count the avoidance class of the reverse of that pattern or the inverse of that pattern. And so the, every pattern has up to eight uh, other patterns that are sort of trivially the same as it. Uh, and so of the six uh, length three patterns, there's only two interesting symmetry classes. Uh, and both of those can be counted with enumeration schemes or with flexible schemes. Uh, so there's really no advantage in using flexible schemes over enumeration schemes uh, for length three, four, five patterns, uh, or for pairs of patterns of length three. Uh, but once you look at patterns of length four, or pairs of patterns of length four, or a pair with one pattern of length four and one of length five, uh, you do get a lot of new stuff with flexible schemes. And in particular, uh, with two patterns of length four, you get to count nine new symmetry classes that you couldn't do with either the insertion encoding or with traditional enumeration schemes. Um, and I, I suspect it's hard to do experiments on patterns longer than this, but I expect that if you did, you would find that flexible schemes do even better. Uh, however, flexible schemes do, do come with some drawbacks. Uh, traditional enumeration schemes, you could have a pre-computed uh, limit on how long uh, the gap conditions we have to consider are. Uh, whereas for flexible schemes, you don't get that. So you just have to keep on looking until you give up. Uh, and then this is actually something that Dr. Z already asked about, uh, but they're, they're slower than the insertion encoding because they run in uh, O of n to the d plus two time, where d is the depth of the scheme, whereas the uh, insertion encoding runs in O of n. All right, so one other topic that I wanted to mention is a covincular pattern avoidance. And so a covincular pattern consists of a permutation and then some set of indices of that permutation. And the way to think, the way to talk about containment of a covincular pattern is that a permutation contains this pattern if it contains sigma as like a regular permutation. Uh, so first it has to contain it as a regular permutation, but then the occurrence of sigma in it has to have this extra special property uh, that if j is an x, if j is in the set of indices, then whatever permutation elements uh, correspond to j and j plus one have to be just one apart in value. Uh, so for example, one, four, two, three contains the vincular pattern or the covincular pattern one, three, two, and then the set two, but it avoids one, two, three, and then the set one, two, uh, because three and four are consecutive values, so we're allowed to have two in that set, but one and three are not consecutive values, so we're not allowed to have one, uh, one in that set. Um, so there really isn't so much to say about flexible schemes for covincular patterns other than the fact that they work. Uh, they work with some modifications. Uh, the main modification is that prefix permutations and downfixes now have to be treated as spaced, which means that some consecutive values are treated as being non-consecutive. Uh, and again, flexible schemes are able to enumerate many more classes than previous uh, methods were. So then the last enumeration scheme uh, topic that I want to talk about is when do schemes not exist? Uh, so one, usually you start looking for a scheme uh, and then you decide how much work you're willing to do. Uh, and once you've done that much work, if you haven't found a scheme yet, you conclude that there is no scheme. Uh, but what's interesting is that sometimes you can actually do some work and at the end of all that work, prove that there's actually no scheme. And you do that using the sphere, which says that if you have a set of patterns whose longest increasing interval has length L. So an interval in a permutation is some set of permutation elements that are consecutive both in position in the permutation and also consecutive in value. And then an increasing interval is just an interval where all the elements are increasing. So suppose that this inequality holds for some K uh, and take pi prime to be the the downfix one, two, up through k minus one. If you know that this downfix is ES irreducible, so traditional enumeration scheme irreducible, then uh, 
Also, if you make that down fix one longer, you're still going to be ES or traditional scheme irreducible. Uh, and what that means is that since you can keep on finding longer and longer down fixes that can't be reduced, it must be the case that no finite scheme exists. Uh, in particular, if the longest increasing interval has length one and one, two, three is ES irreducible, then no scheme exists. Um, all right, so this is an even more hand wavy proof than the last one. Uh, let's suppose that uh, I'm trying to avoid one, three, two, four. I want to show that one is ES irreducible. Uh, so this picture shows that the one in this down fix one, two, three is ES irreducible because I have a one, three, two, four pattern. So if I got rid of that one element, the one that, that's the one that's in the, the bottom left hand corner, now I no longer have a one, three, two, four pattern. So it's, it's bad. It's not allowed to delete that one. And what I'm going to do to make a one, two, three, four pattern where the one is still irreducible, or is still not ES irreducible, is I'm going to take the final, uh, the final down fix element, that final blue dot, and I'm going to add a new blue dot right next to it. And that new blue dot is going to form an increasing interval with the original blue dot. Uh, and the point is, is that increasing intervals are sort of special in permutations, because if I use two elements of an increasing interval uh, as part of a pattern, they have to form an increasing interval in that pattern. And since 1, 3, 2, 4 has no length to uh, increasing intervals, I can't use those rightmost two blue dots both in a 1, 3, 2, 4 pattern. Uh, and so it didn't matter, it didn't affect anything that I added in one. All right, so some future work on enumeration schemes. Uh, it would be interesting to build flexible schemes for words. Enumeration schemes already exist for words. It seems very reasonable to have flexible schemes for them as well. Um, also, the original question, uh, or Vatter's original question was, can you build uh, something that can count anything with a finite uh, enumeration scheme or regular insertion encoding or finitely many simple permutations? And so this is actually not a complete answer to that question. But if you could modify flexible schemes to count any class with finitely many simple permutations, then it would be. Uh, and finally, an interesting direction to go would be to combine enumeration schemes with the structure paradigm. Uh, and I'll talk more about what that would look like in the next section, uh, because I'm going to sort of give it an example of, of how that could work. All right, so that is it for enumeration schemes. So this next part is uh, counting 1, 4, 2, 3, or equivalently 1, 3, 4, 2 avoiding permutations. Uh, and again, this is going to be sort of an example of how you might combine enumeration schemes and the structure paradigm. And the structure paradigm means uh, trying to count a permutation by decomposing it into component structures that are simpler or easier to count. Somehow. So a little bit of history about this sequence. Uh, the sequence uh, of uh, avoid 1, 3, 4, 2, n, it has a known generating function that's given on the slide. This generating function was originally found by Bona in 1997 through a bijection with a certain class of labeled trees. It was also shown by Bloom and Ellis Alde. Uh, in 2013 through a bijection to a certain class of dick paths. And what we're going to do today is we're going to show a recurrence for this sequence using both enumeration scheme and structure ideas. The first observation that we have to make is that the down fix 2, 1 is ES irreducible because we can delete 1. And this is for the same reason that 2, 1 was ES irreducible back when we were trying to avoid 1, 3, 2. Or, sorry, 1, 2, 2 3. Um, on the other hand, uh, if we're if we if our down fix is not two one if it's one two instead, uh, if some permutation avoids one four two three oh sorry sorry so I forgot to tell you why one four two three is the same as avoiding one three four two, uh, and it's just for a trivial reason it's because they're inverses so counting the permutations that avoid one three four two is the same as one four two three. Um, anyway, so if you avoid one four two three and you have a one two down fix then all the elements uh, in the permutation between the one and the two are smaller than all the elements after the two, which is exactly what's shown uh, in the picture at the bottom of the slide. Uh, fortunately though, or, uh, much more than that is true. So we have a lemma that says that not only is that true, but actually there's some index coming before the i uh, so that everything between that index and the j, so including i, uh, those are all of the smallest elements of the permutation, 
and everything that's not between those indices is larger. And so we can divide up the permutation as you see on the screen, with some big stuff, some small stuff, and then some more big stuff. Uh, and then we get another lemma that says that if you define all of the big stuff to be pi up and all of the small stuff to be pi down, and we're gonna actually say that pi up prime is pi up plus the very first element of pi down, then you can know whether a permutation avoids one, four, two, three, just by knowing whether pi up prime and pi down avoid one, four, two, three. And so this is sort of the structure idea, that by making statements about these two uh, component permutations, we can conclude things about the avoidance properties of the whole permutation. Hey, Yona, I have a question. Yeah. Can this argument be automated so possibly the computer can find other cases? Or that's well, so I think, I think that it's, I, I'm hopeful that it could be. Um, this is unfortunately like a sort of an ad hoc. This is, unfortunately, this section is kind of ad hoc and it specifically works for 1423. But I think that the ideas could be generalized, could with some, with maybe quite a bit of work, uh, be generalized so that a computer actually could have found this and could find similar arguments for other classes. Yeah, that would be nice. Also, yeah. your, your proof is probably shorter than the previous proof, isn't it? Um, I think so. I would have to check again to make sure. Um, okay. But I think that, that, that that's true. It's also like, I mean, it's not entirely clear how you would score them, though, because this proof just gives a recurrence. It doesn't give a generating function. So in that sense, it's like maybe not as desirable as uh, maybe Bona's proof. But on the other hand, you don't have to also know how to count a certain class of labeled trees. So in that way, maybe it's nicer. Um, so, yeah. No, but by the way, Bona, adder, Bona cheated. Adder, he just quoted the well-known results that other people did as the generating function. So in this case, yeah, I, think, I think it's a matter of taste. Yeah. Okay. Um, all right. So anyway, so now we have two structure lemmas. And what together they suggest is that in order to count all the number of pies, uh, you could just find the number of pi downs and multiply them by the number of pi ups. And then you get the total number of ways to combine pi up and pi down. Uh, and unfortunately, that's not quite going to work. And the reason that that's not quite going to work is that that's going to count permutations once for every single way that you could decompose them into pi down and pi up. And some permutations have a lot of different ways that you could de decompose them into pi down and pi up. Uh, so the solution then is to count each permutation once when the first component of pi up is as large as possible. And for what it's worth, this is the part that I think is the, the most, would be the most challenging to, to automate. Um, anyway, it is possible to do though, and when you do it, you get the resulting recurrence that looks like this. And although this is sort of a, it looks a little bit complicated, but it runs extremely quickly. So uh, now I have one last permutation pattern topic to talk to you about, and then one more topic after that. Uh, so this topic is resolving a conjecture of David Callan uh, that a certain OAS sequence counted a certain class of, permu of pattern avoiding permutations. Um, so before I start, though, I have to talk a little bit about dashed permutations, or dashed patterns, rather. Uh, so a permutation contains a dashed pattern if, first of all, it has to contain this pattern as, like, a regular pattern. Uh, and then it also has one additional restriction, which is that if the dashed pattern uh, has no dash between two elements, then those two elements have to be represented in the permutation by consecutive elements. Let's look at the examples. Uh, 251346 contains 3-1-24, and that's because it contains 3124 as like a regular pattern. And an occurrence of that has the four and the six right next to each other, as the two and four require. Uh, however, 251346 is 21-3-4. And that's because even though it literally contains 2134 as a subsequence. The two and the one have to be consecutive, and they're not in this permutation. So Callum had a conjecture about these, which is that if I define a sequence in the, uh, as you see on the slide, they count the number of permutations to avoid this set of four patterns uh, that you also see on the slide. Uh, and so the purpose of this section is to show that, yeah, that conjecture is true. 
Uh, there's two steps to proving that it's true. The first step is what I'm calling D dashing. It's taking this conjecture about dashed patterns and turning it into a conjecture about regular patterns. Uh, as it turns out, if we let B be the set of dashed patterns where there's dashes everywhere, so in other words, there's absolutely no restrictions on where uh, elements occur relative to each other, that's the same as making B just a set of regular patterns. Uh, and as it turns out, uh, the number of, or the, the permutations that avoid the, the dashed patterns are actually exactly the same as the permutations that avoid the undashed patterns. Uh, and so now we can answer this question as just a, a regular permutation avoidance question instead of a, a dashed pattern avoidance question. Uh, and the way that we're going to do that is we're going to look at all of the different ways that you can take a length uh, n minus 1 pattern and turn it into a length n pattern. So I've written again the patterns that we're trying to avoid at the top of the slide. Uh, and notice that every pattern uh, that avoids all four of those patterns either has one and two consecutive or it has either one or two occurring at the very end. Uh, so that suggests that in order to make uh, a permutation longer, we can increase each element in the permutation by one and then do one of four things. Uh, either insert a one right before the two so that they're consecutive, insert a one right after the two so that again they're consecutive, uh, add one at the end of the permutation, or uh, have one bump two so that one goes where two used to be and then two goes at the end of the permutation. And as it turns out, uh, every permutation of length n uh, is mapped by each of these four maps to a permutation of length uh, n plus 1 that still avoids all the patterns of b. And in fact, every permutation of length n plus 1 that avoids all the patterns of b is given by uh, a permutation of length n under one of these maps. Uh, each permutation gives four new permutations. Uh, of length n plus one, and some of those permutations are, are gonna be double counted, but we can figure out exactly how many are double counted. It turns out that there's two double counted permutations for every permutation. Uh, so there's two length n plus two double counted permutations for every length n permutation. Uh, so that immediately gives us this nice recurrence. And since the recurrence uh, has this, or this is the same recurrence that defined our original sequence, they also have the same initial conditions, so therefore our original sequence does count this set of uh, pattern avoiding permutations. Hey, Jonas, does this sequence also count other objects? Yeah, it counts a ton of different objects. Ah. Um, you can go here. So as a reminder, this is the OAS sequence. If you want to know all the other objects that it counts, you can go check that, check out that sequence in the OAS. But yeah, so there's, can you, I think there's can you make your beautiful proof into a bijective proof? to one of the families that are counted? Um, I have not looked into doing that, but I'm sure that there, there's, enough, there's enough other classes that there's bound to be some nice bijections in there. Yeah, yeah, I'm sure that you can make it into a beautiful bijection to get a nice proof. Yeah. Okay, go ahead. All right. So my last topic is a generalization of Claude uh, Lenormand's Rabotet operation. Uh, so this was introduced uh, to me by Neil Sloan, uh, and the operation is that you write uh, out the binary representation of some integer n. Uh, you, you look at each run of consecutive ones and consecutive zeros, and you reduce the length of each one by one. Uh, and then whatever you get at the end, that's the binary expansion for r of n. So for example, if I'm trying to find r of 12, I would write 12 in binary as 1, 1, 0, 0. I would take... Uh, each of my runs of ones, or my one run of ones, and chop one one off. I would take my run of zeros and chop a zero off, and I would be left with one zero, which is the binary expansion of two. So R of 12 is two. Um, all right, so Sloan introduced this, uh, introduced uh, looking at sums of these Rns. And so he defined L of K to be the sum from N, or the sum of R of N over all N with length k plus one binary representations. Uh, and he conjectured that L of k had this nice formula, and that was quickly proven by Zeilberger and Wu. So what I want to do is I'm going to generalize this to use different bases. Uh, there's nothing special about binary. We could have a Rabotet operation in any base B. 
the way that we're going to do that is we're going to start by writing out the representation of n in base b. We're going to reduce the length, of, or uh, we're going to look at each run of consecutive uh, digits, where, or each run of uh, all of the same digits consecutively. And we're going to reduce the length of each run by one. And then the result is going to be the base b representation of r of bn. And we'll def define l of bk. We have the sum of r of bn over all n whose uh, base b representations have k plus one digits. Uh, and we can find a nice closed form for l of bk. And the way that we're going to do that is we're going to separate numbers uh, with length k plus one base b expansions into cases uh, based on whether the last two digits are the same or the last two dig digits are distinct. That's going to let us derive the recurrence that you see on the slide. And then we're going to notice, we're going we're to conjecture a formula for it and notice that that formula happens to have the same recurrence and initial conditions as LB. Uh, we can also talk about higher powers of the Rabote operation. Uh, so, for instance, we can define L of PBK to be the sum of R of BN to the P over all N whose base B representations have exactly K plus 1 elements. Uh, and as it turns out, in order to find uh, a formula or an explicit formula for that, we're going to have to introduce another, uh, another function, uh, L of LPBK, which is the sum of R of BN to the P over all N whose base B representation has K plus one digits, the last digit of which is L. Uh, and we can find a nice system of recurrences that represent each of those two functions in terms of each other. Um, and we can't quite solve these systems of recurrences uh, the way that we could when we weren't taking higher powers. Uh, but we can do uh, using this maple package Rabote is we can find a closed form uh, for L, P, B, K, uh, whenever B and P are fixed and K is variable. We can also make conjectures about what L, P, B, K is going to be uh, whenever P is fixed and uh, both K and B now are allowed to be variable. Uh, and so here are some of the things that this maple package is able to show. Uh, it's able to show, for instance, that L of 2, 2, K is given by this, this formula here. And it conjectures, but is not able to prove that L of 2 BK is given by this, you know, somewhat more complicated, but it takes B as a variable instead of making you input a, a, an exact value. Uh, if you're not, with this formula. the computer cannot prove it, but can you prove it? Um, I did not actually try to prove that. So officially, um, it's still a conjecture. It is still a con I mean, it's a, it's a, you know, quote conjecture, like, we have a, a whole lot of evidence that it's actually true. Yeah. Um, but I, I don't have a proof that, that that is actually the right formula yet. But, but it's not routine to prove it? You have a recurrence? So you cannot have plug it into the recurrence? Or some issues? Um, I, think, I, mean, the, I think the reason that it's not trivial to prove it is yeah. because B is a variable, and this recurrence has a sum that is, uh, has a, and the number of terms in this sum is, is B. And so uh, the number of terms in this sum is, is a variable once we let B be a variable. I interesting. So it's not entirely trivial to prove it. So it's still a conjecture. Right. So that's, that's why it's not, that's why we're able to prove it when B is fixed. Uh, but yeah. it's not as easy to prove when B is a variable. Oh, interesting. Thank you. Um, you're welcome. All right. So, uh, right. Uh, so in conclusion, experimental mathematics is a power, powerful enumerative tool. Uh, computers are able to rigorously count many different pattern avoidance classes, uh, especially if you use them with uh, flexible schemes. And I think that they could probably count managed to combine both the structural and enumeration scheme approaches uh, to automatic enumeration. Um, so thank you all for listening. Uh, do you have any questions? Thank you very much, Yona. Any questions from the general public before the committee meets? Um, I just wanted to say this was fascinating. 
I really enjoyed it. And I was just wondering if there's any practical application that you might tell us about this. Like, will it make our, will it make our elections safer? Um, I'm told that if you do enough permutation patterns that can cure coronavirus. <laughs> I think I'm already cured. <laughs> Other questions? I, I don't actually know of any um, applications. Okay. I'm sure that they exist. I'm sure that there are some out there. Well, thank you. Can this I say something? Application is a dirty word. So, <laughs> that's as well. <laughs> Other questions? Yeah, I knew that would be controversial. <laughs> Other questions from the audience? In that case, the audience is I'll kind of asked to leave. Yeah. yeah, go ahead. Hey, your name is Danny. Hey, yeah. Danny. Hey, so I, I had to step out for a minute, so I might have missed it, but in the, your intro, you said that computers are great for experimental math because they are faster than us and can do lots of computations, and they're smarter than us, and those were separate. So I caught the part where the computer was faster and could do lots of tedious computation really quick. I missed the part where it gave an insight that didn't occur to you. It actually, um, I mean, I guess I would say that there are, there are two things that computers do that I think could count as giving insights that didn't occur to me. Um, so one of them is when you like do a bunch of experimentation that suggests a conjecture to you that you never would have come up with if you hadn't done all of that experimentation. No, no, that's the first part. That's 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 just cranking things out. I want a better example. I mean, the... I think that's that the math. advantages that computers have over people are all derived from the fact that they can do more computations more quickly and without making mistakes. Okay. Um, and that's so not, aside, not, aside not, from that fact, I don't think that computers have advantages over people. Okay. Too bad. Thank you. Sorry. Sorry. I, I beg to differ, but that's a different story. <laughs> uh, other question from the, obic, or ob, from the audience? In this case, the general public is asked to kindly leave, so we have privacy with the candidate and the members of the committee. So we have uh, uh, five seconds to leave. Thank you. Uh, thank you. We love you. Congratulations. Awesome. You're smarter than any computer. Good work, Yona. Computer. Hi, Yona. <laughs> okay, the committee members. Oh, hi, Vince. Uh, hi, uh, Professor Bangav. Hi, uh, Spastic. Uh, are there any questions for the candidate? Uh, yeah, I, I had a somewhat speculative question. Uh, you hear me? I can hear you. Oh, okay. So, um, does the computer uh, potentially help uh, when you have to deal with the uh, patterns of... Uh, sorry. When, when the patterns themselves are growing? Sorry, do the patterns themselves what? Uh, uh, they're no longer fixed length. Let's say that um, I'm interested in uh, enumerating permutations of length n, avoiding some pattern of length k, but k is not fixed. Um, so like it's an infinite family of, per of patterns? Right, but uh, I no longer hope to see a close form expression because, of course, you've got to write down your pattern of length k uh, in order to be able to hope for a, for a close form expression. But you might be aware of um, what's this called? Um, Adam and Gallo did. Uh, the Marcus uh, Tardish theorem. Yeah. Says that if you forbid any pattern, the growth rates are most exponential. Uh, for any k, if you forbid a pattern of length k, uh, the number of permutations of length n avoiding this pattern grows at most like 
some big constant to the end. Um, yes. Uh, I was just curious if you might be able to say something about what this constant looks like. Could the computer help you with uh, trying to understand things like this? So are you are you asking if the computer can find this uh, like this CK that's being raised to the power n? Right. If not find, at least help estimate. I see. Um, I I haven't thought a lot about it, but it seems reasonable to hope that it could. Um, because what you're essentially getting is, uh, you're getting, well, okay, so I guess this is maybe, I'm not, let me, let me answer the, let me answer the question that I'm, I'm, I've started to answer, then you can tell me if that was actually your question. Sure. Um, but if you, essentially what you're getting is you're getting, uh, a recurrence, uh, for your, for your enumeration, uh, sequence. And we know quite a bit about taking recurrences and turning them into uh, sort of asymptotic behavior. Mm -hmm. And so it certainly seems reasonable to hope that you could use a scheme to get a recurrence to, to learn about asymptotic behavior. Uh -huh. um, but I guess even, even in this case, I'm still thinking of considering one fixed K pattern at a time. 